Well, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Barnard, President of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and my boss as a Food for Life instructor. Dr. Barnard is the author of over 18 books, 10 of which are right here next to me. Dr. Andrew Wheel said that Dr. Barnard is one of the most responsible and authoritative voices in American medicine today. Dr. Barnard's groundbreaking research has revolutionized the approach to type 2 diabetes, chronic weight problems, menstrual symptoms, and other common conditions. Dr. Barnard is editor-in-chief of the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians. This little book is given to all second year medical students in the United States today. It's so exciting. It gives me goosebumps. He is the New York Times bestselling author of Dr. Neil Barnard's program for reversing diabetes, the 21 day weight loss kickstart, the vegan starter kit, and most recently, your body and balance the book we will be hearing more about today. He is a faculty member of the George Washington University School of Medicine, where he received his medical degree. He's also the founder of the Barnard Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Dr. Dean Ornish described Dr. Barnard as a brilliant visionary, one of the leading pioneers in educating the public about the healing power of diet and nutrition. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the Polk Wellness Professionals and Chat and Chew Joint Session. Welcome, Dr. Barnard. Well, thank you so much. That's such a kind introduction. Thank you. Um, shall I jump in? Yes, it's all yours. Very good. All right. Well, thank you for letting me spend some time with you today. I'd like to share my screen and talk with you about how foods can affect our health in surprising ways. Before I do, let me adjust the video here a little bit. It looks a little bit intense. Just this too. For some reason, it's looking awfully bright. Let me just undo that. This. Let's see if that works a little bit better. There we go. That looks a little bit more human. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, the idea of getting your body back into balance. And what I'm really referring to here are hormones. Now, the old idea was that we eat a bad food, a big, greasy burger. And that will cause problems, like I gain weight or my cholesterol goes up or I get diabetes or something like that. And that's true enough, but we can be much more sophisticated about it. And when we are, we easily get control over a lot more aspects of our health. So we eat foods, those foods can control hormones. And when that happens, we have all kinds of things that we can change in our lives. So that might raise the question, what are hormones? <laughs> What are hormones? Well, let me describe that. Hormones are like letters that you get in the mail. They, they, they are made in one part of your body. They go through the blood. They provide information to another part of your body, like your thyroid hormone at the base of your neck. Uh, the, the thyroid gland at the base of your neck, it makes thyroid hormone that goes in the blood to give energy to your cells. So it's like a letter in the mail. However, there can be problems. Uh, maybe, let's see, maybe I get not enough letters in the mail. Maybe I get too many letters in the mail, too much information. If you have not enough hormones or too much in the way of hormones, either way, hormone haywire. So I wanna walk you through a couple of these cases. And in my book, Your Body in Balance, I describe all kinds of hormones from thyroid hormone to insulin, to estrogens, to testosterone, how foods modify them and how your health suddenly becomes something that you can approach with a great, more, uh, great deal more confidence. But let me start with kind of the granddaddy of them all, insulin. It was, as you probably know, um, discovered 100 years ago. A century ago, people realized that insulin made in the pancreas goes through the blood to allow glucose to get into the cells of the body. And if insulin is misbehaving a little bit, the blood glucose levels rise. 
exercises too much, you got diabetes. So back in 2003, the US government gave my research team a grant to try to test out a new sort of dietary approach for diabetes. And what we tested was the plant-based diet. We compared that to a conventional diabetes diet. Let me walk you through what I mean by that. Conventional diet means don't eat so much calories. You need to lose weight, so cut calories. Uh, keep your carbohydrate from getting too high. Don't eat too much bad fats. That's the conventional approach. But the plant-based approach was completely different. We didn't limit calories. We, didn't, we did not limit carbohydrate. What we said was no animal products, minimize oils, and favor what we call low glycemic index foods. Um, if that's a kind of a technical term, it just means foods that release their natural sugars really slowly. So um, white bread is high glycemic index. You eat white bread, your blood sugar rises. But if you eat a bean or even pasta, it releases its natural sugars pretty gradually. So that's low glycemic index. So the experimental diet, no animal products, minimize oils, favor the low glycemic index foods like vegetables and beans and that kind of stuff. Okay, to cut to the chase, what this study showed is that when we look at hemoglobin A1Cs, I know many of you are familiar with A1C. It's the main measure that we use for blood sugar control. And if a person has diabetes, we normally aim to keep it under about seven. Well, our participants were around eight to start. And on the conventional diet, that's the red line, they dropped nicely about 0 0.4 absolute percentage points. But on the vegan diet, the plant-based diet, they dropped about three times more than on the conventional diet. And suddenly we had a diet change that was easy to do, that didn't require calorie counting, didn't require limiting carbs or worrying about them at all. And yet the drop in hemoglobin A1C was a little bit better than we were seeing with oral medications. And that was really striking. And when we talked to people who began this approach, this was Vance, who had been a policeman in Washington, DC, then he worked in a bank. And um, then he was uh, one of our first research volunteers. And over about a year, he lost 60 pounds. He stopped his diabetes medications. His A1C, which had been in poor control at 9.5, dropped to 5.3, which is in an absolutely normal range. And when I'll never forget when Van, Vance got his results. I, I have to say, to say, I have to say, I thought back to when I was in medical school. Because I had been taught what you might have been taught too, that diabetes doesn't go away. Once you've got diabetes, you'll always have diabetes. But here was a man on no medication with an absolutely normal A1C level. And he could go into any clinic in the world and they would not diagnose him as having diabetes. So what's the deal? Let, let me show you the cause of type two diabetes. And if you're doing something else, if you're texting or something, let me ask you to just set that down and give me your full attention for the next two minutes. Because I wanna show you the cause of type two diabetes. It's not what we had thought 20 years ago. Here's what it is. You see this big purple oval, that's a cell in your body. Your, your body's made up of millions and millions and millions of cells. And this is, say, let's call it a muscle cell. Muscle cells run on glucose. That's their fuel. It's their gasoline. And the glucose is all in the blood. And if it can get through that cell membrane, it'll power that cell. And that's the problem. The glucose is building up in the blood and it won't get through the membrane. Look at that, it just bounces right off. The cell membrane of the muscle doesn't let glucose just come in willy-nilly. Well, what do I do? I've got little channels to let it in, but they're closed. I need a key. And the key is, you guessed it, it's insulin. So the insulin key goes to the surface of the cell and there it is. And once that insulin key attaches, if things are going right, it opens up these little channels and in comes the glucose. Hooray, everybody's happy. Yay, swell. Okay, so what could go wrong? Here's what could go wrong. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. You ever been there? Seen the movie? <laughs> well, anyway, um, that was dinner for us in Fargo. And that was lunch. And that was breakfast. You know what I'm talking about? Sausage, bacon, all this kind of stuff. And lots of other greasy foods are part of our diet. And if you were to just look at how much fat is in these foods, it builds up. So what? 
so what if there's a little bit of fat in my meat and cheese and fried foods and all that stuff? Who cares? Who cares is you, the fat from the foods you eat, gradually builds up inside your muscle cells and your liver cells. And when that happens, by the way, doctors hate words like fat. It's only got one syllable. So we prefer to call it intramyocellular lipid, but it's fat inside your cells. So the insulin key now attaches to, this, to the cell and nothing happens. It doesn't work. The cell is all gummed up. Insulin resistance has arrived. So now the glucose molecules don't get in. They can't get into the cell. Swell. So my blood sugar is rising. Now anything I eat causes my blood sugar to rise. I'll eat an organic apple that I got at Whole Foods, my blood sugar goes up. I eat bread, I eat beans, I eat pasta, anything makes my blood sugar rise because I've got insulin resistance. It didn't start with the apple. That apple's healthy. I should be able to extract that healthy glucose out of it and use it to power my muscles, but it's not working. What do I do? Well, in our research study, we did a couple of things. We removed animal products. And if I remove animal products, how much animal fat is in my diet? Well, none. And if I keep oils low, then something amazing happens. And that's that that fat starts to go away. The fat starts to dissipate from the cell. And as that fat goes away, the insulin resistance gets better and better and better. And now you're insulin sensitive and the glucose can come back inside again. And your doctor might say, I don't know what happened, but you don't have diabetes anymore that I can find. So that's the miracle that has come in over the last couple of decades and that we now accept as the everyday uh, approach to diabetes that everybody ought to be following is tackle that insulin resistance and let's see if the diabetes can go away. Okay, I wanna get just a little more complicated if you don't mind. Let's get on the train. Let's go up to New Haven, Connecticut. We're gonna meet our friends at Yale University. They brought in 26 healthy volunteers. Everybody got a glucose tolerance test. Did you ever have this? You go to the lab, give you a little plastic cup full of syrup, 75 grams of syrup. Drink that down, please. You drink it down and it is syrupy goo. Your blood sugar starts to rise, but if all is well, it will come right back down because you're insulin sensitive. The glucose that you just drank goes right into your cells. Your blood sugar doesn't stay high. However, the researchers discovered that not everybody was healthy. There were some people who were insulin resistant, meaning they drank that sugary goo and their blood sugar went up and it stayed up. The sugar wouldn't get out of their cells. Well, what's that about? Okay, who are these people? They're young, late 20s. They're skinny, 130 pounds, 140 pounds. That's not heavy. Uh, A1C in the absolutely normal range. Nobody has diabetes. But now let's run them in our MR scanner. Do you ever have an MRI, twisted ankle or some other kind of diagnostic test? Same machine, but we're, we're gonna do a special test called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna look inside your muscle cells. I'm gonna look for that fat that I said builds up in your cells. Okay, all the volunteers went in the machine. We look at the amount of fats in their cells. This is the way the data come up. On the left-hand side, every dot that you see there, that's a person. And the dot represents how much fat is inside their muscle cells. These are the healthy people. We call them control subjects, insulin sensitive subjects. Those are the insulin resistant subjects. Okay, you don't have to look twice to see a huge difference. They've got all this fat inside their cells. Now for extra credit, I wanna see if their cells are working. Remember from high school biology, do you remember your mitochondria? Mitochondria are the little organelles inside your cells that do their bidding. And in the healthy subjects, they were working fine. In the insulin resistant subjects, they were not. What does this mean? This means young, thin people can still have fat building up inside their cells and I can measure it. And when that happens, they can't handle glucose anymore. And when I look at what's happening in their cells, they're just not working very well. Here's what I'm really worried about. You can go into any high school in the state of Florida or anywhere else, grab kids who are 16, 17 years of age and put them in the scanner. What you will see is frightening. 
they're young, they're healthy, they think they're doing fine, but the fat is starting to build up inside their cells. It came from grilled cheese sandwiches, chicken wings, fish, fried foods, too much use of oil. And as the fat is building up inside their cells, they're starting to get insulin resistant. Their blood sugars are starting to rise a little bit. They don't know that this is happening and they won't be diagnosed with diabetes for another 15 years or 20 years. And when they are, they'll be told, well, this runs in your family. It's genetic, nothing you could have done. It started in a high school cafeteria or maybe it started at home. Maybe it started with foods they learned to, to, to love and never realized could cause the fat to enter their cells and disrupt their ability to handle glucose. Okay, I wanna shift gears. We've already talked about insulin. We've seen how we can take this hormone that's misbehaving and we can make it work again. Uh, let's focus on estrogens, estrogen changes. Um, now in my book, Your Body in Balance, I describe lots of estrogen issues from menstrual pain and PCOS and others. But now I wanna focus on an issue that we've just finished a couple of big research studies on, and that's menopausal hot flashes. Oh, I know what you're thinking. That's just part of life. I'm 50, I'm 55, and it's gonna to happen to me. Well, maybe the ovaries are no longer releasing eggs, estradiol and progesterone drop. And so you'll have hot flashes and vaginal changes. And sometimes your mood can go a little goofy for a short period of time. And what, is the, what are hot flashes? It just means that your blood vessels are dilated. The blood vessels in your skin, they're suddenly opening up and the, the heat comes out. It's just like somebody went over to the radiator and they just opened it up. It's 150 degrees. If this happens at night, you're gonna wake up in a big sweat. And if it happens four or five times a night, you never get a good night's sleep. And you kind of drag through the day and your quality of life is not so hard. And you go to the doctor who says, I've got just the solution for you, take estrogens. We'll call it hormone replacement. And the doctor might say, well, if you read the package insert, you will see the word cancer. They increase the risk of cancer and heart disease and possibly dementia and stroke and blood clots. And so doctors now know that they don't want you to take that very long because it'll increase your risk of disease. If a doctor has 25 women who have HRT for 10 years or more, one in two of those 25 will get breast cancer that that doctor caused. Okay, patients say, wait a sec, I know there's a better way. Well, researchers started to find a better way. Years ago in the 1980s, researchers went to Japan and they discovered that Japanese women were eating rice, noodles, vegetables, not a lot of meat, a little bit of meat, but not much. And they didn't really have much hot flashes. Maybe 15% of them had hot flashes. And the thought was, well, maybe it's the soybeans. Soybeans have what are called isoflavones. And isoflavones, this is the chemical structure. This will not be on the test. Um, they are credited for the breast cancer preventing aspects of soy. As you probably know, soy products re uh, reduce breast cancer risk by about 30%. And we think it's the isoflavones that do that. But we also think maybe they are active in knocking out hot flashes. Maybe, but there was something else. The Japanese diet changed. Oh, maybe in the 1990s, 2000s, it became kind of a burger heavy diet, not as bad as ours, but much more so than in past centuries. And hot flashes went up by about 40%. Now they still like tofu and soy products, but there's something about this overall change in the diet that seemed to escort in hot flashes, breast cancer, heart disease, and depression. Well, what's this about? Here's what happened in the diet over time. Grains fell, especially rice, also potatoes fell. If you look between World War II and, and say around 1990 or so. And what went up was fish went up, meat went up, eggs went up, and big time dairy products. You know, the Japanese diet is not like featuring cheesecake, but it became a much more dairy heavy diet as time went on. Okay, by the way, it's not just soy. Let's go to Cancun. And let's get in our car and drive out two hours west through the jungle. And about two hours west, you'll come into a city called Valladolid and another one called Chichimila. And researchers there interviewed Mayan women. And they found that they didn't have hot flashes. 
I said, no, don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Menopause is no big deal. Well, what the heck are they eating? They're not eating rice. They're eating, their grain is corn. Soybeans? I don't think so. But the bean that they consume in the Yucatan Peninsula is black beans. Eat them every day, big thing. Very cheap, very nutritious. They eat lots of vegetables. This one is called la chaya. And these are traditional healthy foods that have unfortunately been giving way to more meaty dietary habits, but these were the tradition. So researchers started to think, okay, I think there's something about a diet with soybeans, a diet that's plant-based that is a good maybe approach to hot flashes. So our research team decided to do a study and it's called the Women's Study for the Alleviation of Vasomotor Symptoms or WAVES. We brought in postmenopausal women Half of them went on a diet change and the other half were a control group making no changes. What diet? It was three things. No animal products. This is a vegan diet. It doesn't mean you have to have a taste for folk music or wear tie-dye clothes. It just means you're not eating any animal products. Uh, minimize oils. So we're keeping oily foods to a minimum too. No guacamole, no guacamole uh, fests, no greasy French fries on this diet. And we said a half a cup of soybeans every day. And that just meant cooking them up in your instant pot or whatever. And you can also roast them. So they're like dry roasted peanuts. And the participants, we found, we showed them ways to make them. They actually found them to be a really nice snack. Anyhow, <clears throat> uh, the diet that we gave them, we described with this power plate, fruits and grains and vegetables and legumes. Legumes just means beans and peas and lentils. Uh, we asked everybody to take vitamin B12, which as you know, you need for healthy nerves, healthy blood. And the first thing that we noticed is that the diet group started losing weight. The control group did not lose weight. Well, no big surprise. We started this study last September and in September turned to October and November and December. People kind of gain weight that time of year. And that's what happened to the control group. But the diet group, the people who went vegan, on average, they lost almost eight pounds. Good. But what really matters is your hot flashes, especially the hot flashes that are severe or moderate. And there, the intervention group dropped from almost five a day to less than one a day. The control group improved a little bit too, but the intervention group could not believe what was happening. In fact, that was an 84% drop. So we then asked, well, how many of you in this group have any moderate to severe hot flashes at all? And at the beginning, everybody did. After 12 weeks, about 59% had no moderates to severe hot flashes at all. And the other 40% said, yeah, I get some hot flashes, but you know, they're not very often. Doesn't happen too much. Now the control group, no big change. Okay, uh, other thing, we looked at vasomotor symptoms, that's hot flashes, much bigger drop in the diet group. Physical or psychosocial and physical symptoms, same thing. And sexual symptoms improved too. We were surprised by all these things, but the women felt this was empowering. I feel better, I'm losing weight, and I'm never, I don't have to go to CVS to fill, to fill some prescription that's gonna hurt me. I'm just doing this in my kitchen. It was really, really empowering. Now, by the way, let me come back to, to soy. Uh, you probably have heard people wonder if soy could cause cancer. And you'll see this on the internet. It's kind of one of these urban myths that won't die. Um, it comes from the, 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 tr the true fact is that soy does contain the isoflavones that I mentioned. When they were first discovered, uh, researchers found that they could actually attach to estrogen receptors. So they thought, uh-oh, they're gonna cause cancer. Um, however, <laughs> they eventually realized that you have more than one kind of estrogen receptor. The estrogen receptor alpha, you can think of that as sort of the gas pedal of cancer. Estrogen receptor beta, which is where the isoflavones attach preferentially. Think of that as the break on cancer. So the isoflavones, they will attach, but they don't cause cancer, they reduce cancer, about 30%. About this uh, 20, uh, 2008 meta-analysis showed that women consuming the most uh, soy have about a 29% drop in their breast cancer risk, which we will take it, it's a good thing. Uh, well, what about women who have had cancer in the past? You may have known women who had cancer, had breast cancer diagnosis. And their well-meaning physician, who unfortunately wasn't paying too much attention to nutrition literature, said, well, I heard soy, maybe you shouldn't have soy. We've had time to study that. 
five separate cohort studies with more than 11,000 participants were combined. Every woman in the study had had breast cancer. And it was, they were tracked for whether they lived or died. The red line here is the women avoiding soy. They had the highest mortality. The yellow and green lines are women who had a high soy intake, whether they had an estrogen receptor negative cancer at the beginning or estrogen receptor positive cancer at the beginning. All of them had cancer at the beginning. They were all treated and then they just looked to see if they did well. And the people avoiding the soy did the worst. The people who ate more did better. Now I'm not pushing it. You don't have to have tofu and soy milk and so forth, but it doesn't cause cancer. Um, it does the opposite, it improves cancer survival and helps prevent it in the first place. Okay, so let's talk about what a healthy diet is. Fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes, plus vitamin B12. And you do need B12. You need it for healthy blood. You need it for healthy nerves. And I don't care what diet you're on. It's a good thing to supplement. A lot of people run low in it. Okay. Um, you might have been dragged to this talk today by somebody else who said, you might enjoy this uh, information. But now you're hearing me say, wait a minute, we're going to make some pretty big diet changes. How could I do that? If I stop eating chicken wings and things, I'm going to have to live in the garage. Nobody's going to invite me out to dinner. I can't see how this is ever going to work. Well, you know what? We have had thousands of people in our research studies and thousands more in our medical clinic. In fact, some of you have consulted with our doctors at the Barnard Medical Center because we offer telemedicine visits in, in Florida. And you probably are familiar. If you've done this, you're familiar with what I'm going to tell you. We encourage people to make big diet changes because I want you to get the best health you have ever had. And I want you to have more power than you've ever had. And the way we do it is we split it into two, two um, steps. Step one, check out the possibilities. Here's what I mean. We're going to take one week. Not going to take anything out of your diet. But we're going to check out the possibilities of foods you would eat if you were actually following a plant-based diet. I'm going to give you a piece of paper, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. I'm leaving some blanks here because your job for the next week is to fill them in with things that you might eat if you were following a plant-based diet. And I'm going to give you some hints. Let's think about breakfast. I'm going to have, okay, I have oatmeal, but I put a lot of cream on top. Well, let me, I'm going to stop doing that. I'll flavor it with cinnamon and raisins and my pancakes, that glob of butter. I guess I don't need that. And my cold cereal, whether it's bran flakes or corn flakes or whatever it is, I guess almond milk could replace cow's milk. I don't know. I never tasted it. Go to the store, buy it, see what you think. If you don't like it, don't write it down. If you like it, cool. Uh, you go to the store and you discover there are a billion different substitutes for the morning sausage that have no cholesterol, no animal fat. Try a few, see if you like it. If you don't like it, don't write it down. Okay, let's go on to lunch. I'm going to have a pizza without cheese. Wow, can't imagine it. Man, I don't know. Every Italian restaurant would be glad to make it for you with extra toppings. See what you think. Veggie burgers, veggie hot dogs, stir fries. We're just going to try it out and see what we like. Now, if you go out to dinner, we're going to go Italian. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's a nice salad and they're going to give me lentil soup or pasta e fagioli and the angel hair pasta topped with tomato sauce, marinara sauce, arrabbiata sauce. You know what? That, that's the Italian word for angry because it's got a little zip to it. Okay. Those are all vegan, aren't they? I hadn't thought about that. Uh-huh. Latin American. Veggie fajitas, bean burritos, beans. All right, this is I can I can do this. Uh, go to every Chinese restaurant that you'd ever want to. They got rice dishes, vegetable dishes, tofu dishes, all kinds of stuff. And even the sushi bar. You say, skip the fish sushi. What do you got for me? And he'll say, well, I'll make you a cucumber roll. Or wait, how about a sweet potato roll, asparagus roll? What would you like? Have the edamame. Have the seaweed salad. Have the all the other delectable delights that are totally plant based. Now. Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, but they do have a bean burrito, hold the cheese. That's vegan too. Okay, great. Doc, I got a whole list. Seven days is more than enough time. Now, step two. I'm gonna take my list of foods that I like that are plant-based and now all you do is eat them. For the next three weeks, let's do a test. All vegan all the time, but it's super easy because it's only three weeks. And secondly, you've already made your list, okay? Simple. At the end of that time, two things will have happened. Physically, you're changing. If you have diabetes, your blood sugars are coming down. 
so much so that you really have to let your doctor know before you start because some people's blood sugars go down so quickly that they just don't need the same amount of insulin or sulfonylureas or other things and um, talk with your doctor make sure that you let your doctor know and track your blood sugars because they you get you what i'm saying is many people get healthy really fast and if that's the case you need to back off on your medicines a little bit don't do this on your own do this with your doctor same with blood pressure medicines um Okay, uh, the other thing though, is not just physical changes. Your mindset will change. You'll think, I haven't had any chicken wings in the last three weeks, and you know what? I kind of don't miss them especially. Now, you may not believe this what I'm telling you now, but you'll discover there's a world of foods and recipes and websites and programs and movies and other people. There's a big discourse in this direction now that becomes extremely engaging. So my thought is, if you jump in for three weeks and really do it, it, it allows you to, to go through the physical changes and even some taste changes. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, these are some recipes that are actually in my new book, Your Body in Balance. These were done by Lindsay S. Nixon, who is a world's greatest recipe developer. They're simple, they're quick, not that many ingredients, lots of fun to make. Um, so I just wanna thank you for letting me share this time with you. But before I end, let me say one thing. And that is that I, I hope you found this useful, but you may well have friends who have health issues too. So let me ask you, don't keep this information a secret, share it around. If you've got a copy of your body in balance, put a footnote or a post-it note in a couple of the pages you thought were meaningful. There it is. Um, share it with other people around, let them uh, read it too. And, and um, a lot of people are struggling with some health issues. And if we help model a little bit, we're all gonna improve. All right, thanks very much. Uh, let me stop at that point. Maybe there's some questions or comments and I'd be glad to take them. Well, Dr. Barnard, that was absolutely fabulous. And as always, you are the perfect educator. Uh, you break everything down so we can understand it. So thank you for that. I'm going to get the questions started. And I know there's a lot of them in the chat box that we're going to be following up on. But um, I have some relatives who are struggling to conceive. And so I'd like to know what you would recommend me tell them um, on their journey and how we can get some more babies in this world from them. Okay. Um, many people are in that same situation and, and uh, it, it can be a little bit nerve wracking. Um, first of all, it's expensive. Um, when people are going through all kinds of testing and then their family members are kind of looking over their shoulders saying, what are you guys doing wrong? And you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So it can be hard, it can be rough on everybody. Um, let me first talk to the guys. Um, researchers went into fertility clinics and they tested the guys, the men. What we do in a fertility clinic is we look at sperm counts and we, we're looking for three things. Just are there sperm cells there? And number two, are they the right shape? Do they look healthy or are they all kind of banged up and out of shape? And third, can they swim straight? Um, if you don't have a, a proper sperm count or sperm morphology or sperm motility, you're not gonna make a baby. Um, and the researchers in a couple of different studies have looked at what men are eating. And the, there was this big surprise that at first we didn't know what to make of it. Guys who had a taste for pizza. I'm not making this up. Pizza, grilled cheese, cheese in general. They tended to have low sperm counts impaired sperm morph motility and morphology. And at first we couldn't figure out why, but now we of course know why. Um, cheese comes from milk, milk comes from a cow. The cows are impregnated every year to keep their milk consumption high. Pregnant cows make estradiol, female sex hormone. And it gets into the milk and it's concentrated in the cheese and the guy's eating it every day. And the average American eats about 37 pounds of cheese every year. It's not a lot, but it's just enough estradiol to interfere with his fertility. What am I saying? Get the cheese out. Okay, let, let's talk to her. Um, there are a number of conditions that can affect this, um, but uh, one of which, well, let me just mention two real quick. One is endometriosis, where the cells that are supposed to be lining the uterus have um, migrated out and they might be strangling the fallopian tubes or attacking the ovaries. And that's also driven by estrogens. Get rid of the cheese, get rid of it from animal products completely. PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, very common, partly genetic, but much improved by the same kind of diet. So whatever evaluations you're having, 
do two things just as an experiment, which frankly are a whole lot easier than taking your temperature all the time and all the other stuff you're going through. Get the animal products out of your diet, explore the recipes that I've given you, have fun with that part. Keep oils really low too. This is kind of like the diabetes diet, but we're doing it for you. What you discover, your weight comes down, fertility is likely to improve. There you have it. Awesome, awesome. Um, I believe Ken has a question for you. And I think this is going to be a joint effort with Ken and Kathy because we have a before and after to share with you. Yeah, yes, um, Ken's on here because Ken talked to um, Dr. Barnard. Gosh, Ken, how many years ago was it? I can't hear you, Ken. You might need to unmute. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, I think it was yeah. 2018. Um, mm -hmm. And in 2018, I reported that I had been diagnosed with um, prostate cancer. Uh, and uh, at the recommendation of Chat and Chew, I'd gotten the book, The Cheese Trap, had given up cheese, um, and I had, I had started losing some weight. In this picture here, I'm, I have already started losing some weight without trying. And I've struggled with weight all my life. Um, and um, because I had given up cheese, and all dairy, uh, which took me a little while to figure out what all was, you know, what all had dairy in it. Like I was using ranch dressing and I looked at it one day and I said, wait a minute, this is white. I wonder what's in it. And of course there was milk in it. So, you know, I, I, I took me a while to, to get rid of it all, but um, I reported back then that, that my cancer had disappeared and the doctor could said, I can't find it. You know, you're taking biopsies. No, no, it's not there anymore. Um, and since then, uh, I have um, lost a total, a, a total of 90 pounds. I gained back 11, and I'm kind of in the last three years, I've been in steady state at uh, 11 pounds down without trying, uh, which is something I struggled with all my life. Uh, my blood pressure uh, is in the normal range. I used to be on blood pressure meds. My cholesterol is in the no normal range. Uh, I used to have high cholesterol. Uh, I'm not on GERD medicines anymore. That's uh, acid reflux. Um, and since I talked to you, I've, I've given up poultry and almost all seafood. I still have, I don't know, rarely I have some fish, but I, I pretty much have no animal products uh, except for very rare occasions I have fish. So things are going well for me. That is fantastic to hear. And I'll, I'll, I'll bet you your, your doctor took it, must have taken a great interest in that. You know, it's, it's, it's great that you continue to follow with your doctor. We, we don't want to cancel our doctor's appointments, but I do discover that um, physicians often learn from their patients' experiences. Yes, my, my GP um, was telling me, whatever you're doing, keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> it was my urologist that, that was the one who had diagnosed prostate cancer. And I asked him, could it, giving up dairy have anything to do with the prostate cancer disappearing? He said, no, that has nothing to do with it. So uh, he didn't learn from me, but I, my GP did. Well, uh, let me jump in on this. Um, what you've done, first of all, congratulations on the effort you've made and all the incredible results that, that you've had. And it's going to inspire other people. And there's a good scientific basis for what you're saying. Uh, Dr. Dean Ornish, after he did his really groundbreaking work on heart disease, did a study, as you probably know, on men who had prostate cancer. And it was a year long trial. And these were men whose prostate cancer was advancing fairly gradually. So they didn't have to have surgery right away and they could wait a year. Um, and in the group that didn't make any changes, what happened to them was what happens to men who have prostate cancer, which is that their PSA tests, which is what we track, were going up on average, about 6% over for the group overall. But for some, they went up so much, they had to drop out of the study, they had to have surgery or radiation. Um, but the, the experimental diet he tried was very much like the diet we've been describing, no animal products, oils low, really healthy plant-based diet. And there, it was amazing. The average PSA didn't rise. It was actually falling a little bit, about maybe about 4%, which is great. There wasn't anybody who had to have treatment during that period of time. And so anyway, um, the, that study has gotten a lot of notice, including in the world of urology. So um, I think that more and more doctors are gonna say, whatever other treatments we may be using and whatever diagnostics we're gonna use, you're gonna eat breakfast. 
So if it's a breakfast that works with your body, uh, so much the better. Yes, um, and, and I found there's, you know, how I did this was, you know, we had, we have a lot of recipes that we really like. Some of them happen to be vegan. So, well, I can just eat the ones that are vegan. And that's what we did. We, you know, we just eat the vegan things. And, uh, and it tastes good. Keeps my PSA down and me off of meds and keeps the prostate cancer away. And I'm happy. Oh, that's I'm fantastic. To share that with everyone. Th thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ken. Boy, we've got a bunch of questions. Here's one that, um, before we leave Ken though, Linda, can you put up the link about the scary dairy study? Because that was on your podcast, Dr. Barnard, wasn't it? Where you talked about what happened with Japanese men and the, and the dairy as well. So um, is there anything you want to add about that study? Was there anything new in that one? Um, you must mean the study that just came out about a week ago. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, this was a study uh, on milk and prostate cancer. Um, and the, the reason this was important is that prior studies have shown that the more milk men drink, the higher the risk of prostate cancer. But the original studies were done at Harvard. Uh, the, the physician's health study was one. Um, 21,000 physicians, and what they found is the more, more dairy they consumed, the more prostate cancer they had. So they did another study at Harvard called the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, same result, dairy linked to prostate cancer. And as time went on, researchers started to figure that dairy consumption increases something in the blood called IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor, and that's been kind of the main suspect for why it causes prostate cancer. But then other studies jumped in and showed the same result, but this new study was really amazing for a couple of reasons. The first is that it showed what the other studies have shown, that men drinking the most milk had, in this case, about 37% higher risk of prostate cancer. But what was remarkable about it is that this was in Japan. And in Japan, milk was not really in a diet um, until, you know, 50s, 60s, a little bit, but not until maybe the 80s and 90s, then it started to become this big thing. And what you could see is this the early entrance of milk into the, the diet, into men's diets, which seem to be associated with this big spike in prostate cancer. So it, it seems to be a real phenomenon. Yeah. I'm gonna throw out two questions real quick that have to do with oil. Mary is concerned, cause she said, when you say minimal oil, um, does that include avocado, coconut, olive, flaxseed? I thought these were considered good. And then, and, and Carol was wondering about protein. Fish is in Mediterranean, just have black beans and eggs. Is that what we're supposed to eat? So okay. help us with that. Okay. Uh, first of all, about oils. Um, the amount of oil you actually need is really small, just a couple of percentage of your calories. And so let's say you ate some broccoli today and you didn't saute it. You didn't put any grease on it. You didn't put butter on it. You just had plain broccoli. But now take a spray, send it to a laboratory and say, tell me what's actually in that. And they're going to say, well, you won't believe this, but it's about 7% fat. It's natural oils. It's a little bit more than you need. Okay, wait a minute. I'm going to go to my pantry and I'm going to give them some black beans and pinto beans and navy beans and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to send them to the laboratory. And they'll say, yeah, there's a little bit of fat in there too. There are natural oils, maybe about 4 or 5%. Brown rice, about 5%. These natural oils are the ones that the body actually needs. But we might say, well, wait a minute. What if I take an olive? In fact, I'll take 10,000 olives and I'll throw away all the pulp and all the fiber and I'll concentrate it. I'll put it in a jar and I'll call it virgin. And <laughs> the truth is you don't need that concentrated oil. It's something mother nature never really thought of, but for us, it kind of seduces our taste buds. Um, so we're used to kind of an oily way of, of living, but you really don't need those excess bits of oil. Um, now, having said that, the oil in say olive oil or corn oil, they are much better than chicken fat or beef fat. When I say better, they have a lot less saturated fat. And that's also true in comparison with say Chinook salmon. It's got a fair amount of saturated fat too. That's the bad fat. So the vegetable oils are better, but if you're trying to reverse diabetes and lose weight, I keep all the oils low. If you're trying to knock out your hot flashes, try this as an experiment for a couple, three months, vegan, don't add oils to things and uh, see what happens. Oh, Dr. you asked for the protein. Yeah. Dr. Mark, along those lines, as, as far as um, hormones, 
can, will the whole food plant-based diet be helpful to get rid of migraines at the start of a cycle? Um, yeah, migraines can arise in a couple of ways. One is the one that you're describing for a young woman who's in her reproductive years and she'll often have a migraine and you can just about set the clock by when it's gonna hit. Um, in this case, I would do exactly what I just described. No animal products, keep oils low. Why? Back in 1994 at Tufts University, researchers looked at how women's hormonal roller coaster can be smoothed out with diet changes. And they weren't thinking about migraines. What they were thinking about was breast cancer because you want to calm down those estrogen storms to reduce the likelihood of developing breast cancer. And they discovered that if you keep fat really low and fiber really high, your estrogen stays in a healthier range. When you get off that, what I call the estrogen roller coaster of the ups and downs, the migraines are less likely to hit too, at least that we believe. That's, the, that's issue number one. Issue number two for migraine is some people can get migraines that aren't related to your cycle. I mean, men can get migraines. Um, or you can get a migraine when your cycle isn't anywhere on the calendar or right now. Um, what's that about? Certain foods trigger migraines. Number one is dairy. And it's the dairy protein. Um, don't take my word for it. If you got migraines and you were sick to death of having that pounding, throbbing pain and throwing up and feeling terrible and having it last all night long, just do an experiment. No animal products at all. And, and not even a trace, not skim milk, no animal products, zero dairy. Read labels. If it says sodium caseinate, that's dairy. Don't have it. Just see if you do better. Some people, a few people need to go a step further. Getting away from the animal products helps most, but there are other people who might need to also look at some other things. Chocolate, citrus fruits, uh, wheat, nuts, tomatoes, onions, corn, apples, bananas. In a rare case, it's like an allergy. Um, so if that happens, that list of food I just gave you, we take them out of the diet, put them back in one at a time, see which one triggers the, the migraine. So that's my answer. Um, the Cheese Trap, which is the book that, that you kindly mentioned there, Ken, um, it's got in the appendix how to do an elimination diet to see if there are foods that, that are irritating. So uh, along those same lines, uh, Dr. Barnard, what is your take on bioidenticals HRT? Um, I'm sorry to say that it's the cancer risk is the same as for the one that the ones that are more commonly prescribed. And the reason that we say that is that your own hormones, the hormones that are made in your body, which of course are bioidentical because you made them, are associated with cancer. Women who have more estradiol levels have higher risk of postmenopausal uh, cancer. So we don't, we don't recommend that approach. Um, they do have effects that can be ex uh, felt as positive, but we're concerned about the longer term risks. Great. We, we also had a couple questions about diabetes. And by the way, several have said what a wonderful explanation that was of diabetes. Wow, that was tremendous. Right. Um, we have one person that was a little concerned that she may have, um, that was Denise, insulin resistance because her body seems to be slow to metabolize sugar because it, it seems to go up. Her A1Cs are okay, but sometimes her glucose goes high. And then Clyde was worried because he's really done a great job. And I can testify to that on his whole food plant-based diet since February, but he's working to get off medications and he started noticing some of his blood sugar morning scores are higher. Should they be worried or should they wait until their doctor identifies it? Okay, um, if we're talking about type two diabetes, yes. um, that's one that where I was showing that big purple blob, that's your cell. And mm -hmm. so if you ate, maybe like most Americans do, and certainly like I did growing up, growing up in Fargo, um, you don't know it, but inside your cell is all that fat. It takes a little while for that fat to start going away. But what I would suggest you do is have no animal products at all. And if this sounds strict, the tip is to, to focus on the short term. Just work, do this as an experiment. We're gonna say like eight weeks. It's a manageable period of time because that allows you to really do it. Eight weeks, 12 weeks, something like that. So no animal products at all. No chicken, no fish, no beef, no pork, nothing, zero. Um, and keep oils really low too. So the offenders here, peanuts, peanut butter, avocados, oily salad dressings, fried stuff. And once again, do this as a short-term experiment to just see how things go. 
if you do this right, what'll happen is the fat starts dissipating from your cells. For the first day or so, your body's not used to that. You're still really insulin resistant. So anything you eat is still gonna make your blood sugar go high. You're gonna have some rice and your blood sugar will go high. And you think, oh my goodness, what's going on? And you stick with it day after day as the fat comes out of your cells and your cells can take the glucose more, more easily, you'll discover that you're eating rice and other carbohydrate rich foods and your blood sugars aren't going so high. In fact, they're going lower, 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 lower. Um, and everybody's different. For some, that improvement starts on day one. For others, it takes a week or something like that before it starts kicking in. Dr. Barnard, a question came up about the uh, Mediterranean diet and the paleo diet and the keto diet. You want to comment on those? Yeah. Um, Mediterranean diet is um, better for your heart than an un unmodified American diet because instead of butter, it's going to suggest olive oil. It is not helpful for weight loss. If weight loss is a goal, I would not recommend a, a Mediterranean diet. Um, it's uh, because it has fish, it has oils and has some meat in it. And so the, it's got enough calories that it just interferes with weight loss. And the reason I'm telling you that is we did a study where we brought in 64 people who wanted to lose weight. Half of them went on the vegan diet I'm describing. Um, and the other half went on a Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean people were really upset because it sounds romantic. It sounds like I'm at a restaurant on the coast of Tuscany. And my, my, I, suddenly my waistline should transform. And it didn't. <laughs> and they wondered what was going on. Anyway, so that was a 16 week trial. And after 16 weeks, everybody switched. The Mediterranean people went vegan. And suddenly we said, do you remember that olive oil we were telling you about in the Mediterranean part? Stop consuming it, get away from the fish and all that stuff. And they did, and their weight loss just went, it just, it just kicked in all of a sudden. And they thought, now you're talking. The opposite happened with the vegan group. They were vegan in the first place and they were losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. At 16 weeks, we said, stop. Now you go Mediterranean. I want to tell you, they hated it. They went Mediterranean and they said, are you sure I got to eat fish again? And do I have to eat all this oil and all this stuff? And their weight loss stopped and they started gaining weight. So we're not big fans of the Mediterranean diet. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's better than the unmodified American diet, but it's not, as, not, it's not anywhere in the league of a vegan diet. A paleo diet, waste of time. It's a meaty diet that's designed to try to make you think you're going to get on the cover of men's health, wearing a loincloth and carrying a spear. Forget it. You don't need it. So the protein issue um, is always, seems like it always surfaces. And a lot of people are concerned about not getting enough protein on a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah. Um, for some reason, that question has never quite gone away, despite the fact that people aren't too sure what protein is or how they would even know if they weren't getting enough. Like what happens to your like feet fall off or like people have no idea. Um, here's what happens. Researchers, dietitians actually measure the protein content of your diet. And they would say um, the following. Um, you might eat maybe roughly 2,000 calories a day. And if you're a woman, you need about 46 grams of protein a day. Actually, you need less than that, but there's it's got a buffer to make sure you're okay. If you're a man, about 56, 56 grams of protein a day. So what if as an experiment, you were going to eat broccoli? Nothing but broccoli. All day long, you're just getting broccoli, for, not that you would do this, but broccoli for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you think there's no protein in that. That's just a vegetable. Well, if you ate your normal number of calories, let's say you eat 2000 calories a day and all you have is broccoli, you would actually get 146 grams of pure protein. It was hiding in a broccoli. Okay, next day, we're gonna do the experiment again, but we're gonna have lentils instead. Have your 2000 calories worth of just lentils today. You're not gonna have anything else. Now you're gonna get 157 grams of protein that was hiding in the lentils. And if you eat corn and oats and, and um, pretty much any grain, bean, vegetable, you're gonna be getting protein. Uh, which explains why cows, you know, if you eat beef, you're eating a cow, a cow is a vegan. And so how do the cow get the huge muscles? Chickens, pigs, all these animals are eating feed grains and they're getting huge amounts of protein. So you will too, don't worry about protein. The thing you should, the, the two nutrients you should think about 
for calcium. We're not going to have dairy, have green leafy vegetables loaded with calcium and vitamin B12 taken as a supplement. That's really important. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we, we're getting all kinds of great comments too, Dr. Barnard. The uh, woman, uh, Laura Goolsby, who is at Kaiser University, who teaches registered dietitians, commented on how much she appreciates the support you have given to RDs over the years, and you're quite a friend. Um, well, actually, if you, don't mind, if you don't mind, let me say a word for registered dietitians. Yes. Um, in, in our practice, we have many registered dietitians with whom we work. They are absolutely essential. If someone has a medical practice and you see people who are overweight or have diabetes or high cholesterol, the doctor might wave a finger at the patient and say, you ought to change your diet. So who's the expert in making that happen? It's somebody who knows about food and health and science, and those are registered dietitians. So um, in our clinic, the doctor might say diet is important and explain in a two or three minutes how it works, but it's our dietitians who sit down with the patient and the patient's reluctant spouse, <laughs> and they'll make a, a menu together and they'll figure out what they eat. And then the dietitian will see them again, maybe the next week, maybe we take a phone call. And, and, and they're like the world's greatest coach of an Olympic athlete, where you allow that person to, to take that power into their hands and really put it to work. So I, I think every, every medical practice should you, in the same way as you work with x-ray, x-ray, and laboratories, all the things that you need to do a practice, the dietetic, dietetic experts are front and center. Dr. Barnard, Gary has a question about how much flaxseed we should be eating per day. You don't need any, but it has, it has omega-3 in it, um, specifically called alpha-linolenic acid. And if you take up to, you know, maybe a couple of teaspoons a day, something like that, that's fine. If you're trying, if you're really trying to lose weight, I would be careful not to overdo it on them because what you're getting is the oily part um, for omega-3. But, you know, up to maybe two tablespoons, uh, I'm sorry, two teaspoons or two or three, something like that's perfectly fine. Okay. And uh, Liz, are you on there? Because Liz is um, the chair of the program committee for POC Wellness Professionals. You had a question about exercise. I thought we needed to get, finish up with that one. Can you do that one for us, Liz? Unmute yourself. Sure. So... Uh, thanks, Kathy. Hi, Dr. Barnard. So happy to have you here. I have a lot of friends who are avid bicyclists. They go out and bike 40, 50, 60 miles at a time, but then come home and eat tons of junk. Oh, as I said, home. Um, <laughs> is it possible to out-exercise a bad diet? I'm sorry, say that again. Is it possible to? Out-exercise a bad diet. Oh, you mean can exercise counter the effects of all the bad stuff you've been eating? Right. Well, first of all, most people who are involved in, in endurance sports um, sooner or later end, end up on a pretty good diet. Um, not everybody, everybody's different, but they realize that your, your, what your muscles are burning is glucose. Um, and the glucose comes from starches. And so when, you know, in the days leading up to a marathon or a big bicycle race, those people are eating pasta and rice and carbohydrate because that builds up the healthy carbohydrate stores in the liver and the muscle, we call them glycogen, but that comes from carbs. So that's, that's a good thing. So they're eating their beans and vegetables and stuff. And, and what they also find is that steak is gonna slow them down. Um, um, animal fats increase blood viscosity, the blood thickness. And so you don't oxygenate very well and, and your athletic ability really deteriorates on that kind of, kind of a diet. Um, but if, you, if a question is, um, let's say a guy's got a high cholesterol level. He says, don't worry, I'll burn it off. I'll get on my bike and I'll you know, go ride 50 miles today. He, exercise does not reduce cholesterol. Let me say that again. Exercise does not reduce cholesterol. It just, it won't. It's something that you swallowed um, either as cholesterol or more importantly, as bad fat. It stimulates the cholesterol making machinery in your liver. And it doesn't care if you're sitting home on your sofa or on your bike. It happens the same way. Great. Thank you, Liz, for that question. One, I need, I think we will have gotten everybody except for these two questions. One was asking about um, eggs. Eggs are not part of the protein source we should be getting, correct? Right. Uh, and you, you don't need them. You're going to get plenty of protein without them. And, you know, okay. the, the egg yolk is the world's highest source of cholesterol anyway. So, you know, yeah. You and then also um, coconut oil is in the same batch of added oil. So you, what do you say about coconut oil, right? 
skip it completely. Don't have any of it. It's very high, okay. very, very high in saturated fat. Shine your shoes with it, put it in your hair, don't eat it. <laughs> okay. And, and the same, same, with, same with palm oil. You'll see uh, coconut oil and palm oil have been marketed heavily. They're used in everything. They're cheap, they're shelf stable. They're, they're not health foods and I would skip them completely. Okay. Debbie, we you want have one person asking about intermittent fasting. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Yeah, like eating five days and fasting two days, fine. If you want to do it, uh, it's perfectly okay. The only concern I have is what often happens is on about day four, people think I'm going to be fasting pretty soon. And they discover that inadvertently they end up kind of overdoing it a little bit. And then they have their two days off to try to come down. And then, you know, so sometimes it's not so healthy. It's to me, it's sort of like intermittent breathing. You know, you just kind of keep, keep it going the same way and you're probably going to be fine. So if intermittent fasting is used as a way to, to make up for dietary indiscretions, I would just try to follow a healthy diet all the time. But, but if you want to do like a five and two, that's perfectly okay. And what about raw? There's a lot of people now that are leaning towards eating mostly or even some in some cases, all raw food. What are your thoughts on yeah. that? I think it's fine. Um, I mean, we certainly didn't evolve with Sterno. So uh, we were eating raw food all the time. Um, the question really is which foods go well raw. Most fruits go fine raw. Uh, some vegetables do, but some don't. Um, beans, for example, you've got to cook them. You can sprout them if you want, um, but and otherwise, I mean, it doesn't work at all. Uh, cruciferous vegetables, a lot of people will eat broccoli and kale and cauliflower raw, but your digestive tract is going to rebel a little bit and it's going to be happy if you cook them some. I think that's everything I see, Kathy. Yeah, we just, uh, do you, can you tell us how much we need a B12 a day? Yeah, the RDA is 2.4 micrograms. Uh -huh. If you take a multiple vitamin, uh, you're getting enough, probably enough. If you're not getting, and, and frankly, I don't think most people should bother with multivitamins because you don't need all the other vitamins in, that are in there because you're getting them in food. Go to the health food store or go online and get the smallest B12 one that they sell, like a hundred micrograms, maybe 200, maybe 500. Beyond that, you don't, you don't need it unless you have a particular deficiency that your doctor's diagnosed. Okay. Well, I think we're going to have to stop now. You know, we've yeah, got a couple over, questions. We overstayed our welcome. Yeah. And we want to be respectful of your time. So Debbie, why don't you close out for us? Hey, well, once again, Dr. Barnard, we truly appreciate your coming and um, Zooming with all of us. And I believe that we sent you a purple envelope. And did you receive that? And can you open it for us? Right. Yes. Right here. Hope you can see that. And when I open it up, it has two little envelopes in it with very generous donations to support our work at the Physicians Committee. And I want to say a special thank you to, that, to you for that because here we do research studies. Um, we bring in people, we change their diets, we publish our findings, we educate doctors, and we have a lot of programs for people online. That most of what we do is free. Um, I'm a full-time volunteer. I don't get paid. And so, but we got to make sure that our lights stay on and that our work goes forward. And you have helped us do that. So thank you so much. Well, we appreciate you. And even as Laura Goolsby said, you are a friend to dietitians. You are a friend to all of us. And um, your work is phenomenal. We, we just cannot thank you enough. And everybody at PCRM and Barnard, Barnard Medical Center. So thank you. And Debbie, and I, want to, I want to say something too. I, I want to thank you personally, Dr. Barnard, for your system of support that is moving our whole country and, and even extending beyond the world. And it's in our lunch rooms that our ch grandchildren and children go to. It's in the nursing homes. It's in the hospitals, in the lunch rooms there that are feeding the patients. You're ex you've built this wonderful system. Mm -hmm. And one part of the system that we like a lot is your Food for Life instructor program. Because we have Debbie in our area who I just was in her breast cancer class. Um, we're now working on diabetes and 47 enrolled. I mean, and then the Veg Fund funding. So we're not um, groups that, that, ask, that give donations. We usually ask for donations. So we want to just make this stand of this is an important organization. And if you're looking for somebody to give some money to, to help along a good cause, this is a good one to do. So Debbie, what about our next events? And we'll say goodbye to Dr. Barnard and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. Yeah, so Kathy, do you want to talk about our next events? Well, the, the, ne the next event for Chat and Chew will be in January. So if you're getting the email, that'll keep you up to date on it. And um, I think Linda's putting the uh, uh, website there for you. And also our email, if you want to just get on the email list, that's there for you. But we've got one on weight loss, Dr. Roseanne Oliveira. And that's for Chat and Chew. What's with Poke Wellness? Well, Michelle, I think Michelle is going to talk a little bit about poke wellness. Yes. Michelle, are Thank you there? You. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm Michelle Crawford. Um, I'm a wellness coach at Lakeland Regional Health and uh, a co-founder of Colt Legume. It's a local plant-based food startup. So if you want to know more about eating some of this food or even have some of it uh, prepared for you, that's what we do at Colt Legume. Um, and I'm also a community advocate for lifestyle medicine. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to get to co-chair Polk Wellness Professionals with, with Debbie, uh, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. So in early 2020, before everything was locked down, um, I attended an event to, like this one um, that was hosted by Polk Wellness Professionals at Florida Southern College. And we had uh, Dr. Michael Clapper come and speak. And I had never heard of Polk Wellness Professionals before, but I was immediately interested in the work that the, the group was doing and uh, I reached out to see if I could join. And it's been my pleasure to assist in the group's mission for the past um, almost year and a half. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this isn't about me. It's really about, about you guys, about the members of our community um, who we're seeking to educate and empower and serve through the work that we do. Um, we encourage community members to make changes that are going to support them in achieving total wellness. So we're looking for people like you to join us. We're especially looking for folks that work in the wellness space or just have an interest in wellness that can share their talents with us and with the greater community. Um, this is really meaningful work that we're doing that's incredibly fulfilling. And I know that you'll have fun uh, joining us because we, we certainly do. Um, and I think that the link was already shared, uh, polkwellnessprofessionals.org. You can find us there or send us an email at info at polkwellnessprofessionals.org. We would love to have you get involved. Thank you, Michelle. And yes, we do need people who are willing to help spread the word about um, wellness in our community, because it is a big job. We have a very large community and we certainly need to, um, we need to share the wealth with everybody. So thank you, Michelle.